This morning, our text is Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Actually, our text is verse 7, but I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 7. As Solomon opens the book, and again, the purpose of the book being to teach us how to take the commandments of the Lord and apply them to everyday life, or in terms of Pilgrim's Progress, how to walk on the straight and narrow path and not step to off to the right or to the left, and thus incur the Lord's discipline. Uh, This maps out the road for us and shows us how we are to walk, and again, the foundational principle that Solomon would teach above everything else that will help us to apply this is the fear of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel to understand a proverb and a figure the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now again, this is the introduction to the book. It tells us what the purpose of the book is. It tells us to whom Solomon was writing. And it gives us the starting point of true wisdom, which is the fear of the Lord. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. Now, again, we've been asking the question, what kind of a man or woman, young man or young lady or child uh, do you need to be in order to please the Lord? When the Lord is searching the earth, what is He looking for? What is He looking for in you? Is it enough that you're just simply trusting in Jesus Christ? Is that what He's looking for? Well, we know it's true in Scripture that you are saved by grace through faith alone. You are not saved by your works. But does that mean that your works are not important? They are certainly the necessary evidence that you are saved, but is that all that they are? The Bible says that they are also the measure of your love for the Lord. We're going to see this morning they're also the measure of your fear of the Lord. The more that you love Him the more you are going to want to be like Him, the more you're going to want to serve Him. And so the more you will catch His eye as He looks to and fro throughout the earth. Now what the Lord sees, of course, when He looks, He sees that there are some who are going to be more useful to Him than others. A quick look at the Bible is enough to show you that there are those that the Lord was able to use more than others. And it was because, of course, some loved Him more, some feared Him more. Same is true in church history, and the same is true today. Now, we do know that some of that usefulness depends upon what God made us for. Uh, Each of us has a particular purpose that God put us into the world to do, and certainly when the Lord has a greater purpose for someone, He gives to them perhaps greater gifts along with that calling. If that's what He's intending to do, He does give that to certain individuals, but we need to realize at the same time that if we haven't been called to do that something great and don't have the greatest gifts, that means that we're useless. That's not the case. The Lord has a use for each one of us. And it's true that a great deal of our usefulness is going to come from the effort that we put into growing into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is why we've been looking at the things we've been looking at. What can we do to become more like that individual God will use for His glory? Well, we've seen several things. The more that you grow in your love for the Lord and your devotion to Him, The more you cultivate love for your neighbor, to love him as you love yourself, the more you hate this world and turn from it to seek the glories that are above, the more you learn and apply his truth, the more you believe what he says and act on his word, the more useful you will be to him. 
and certainly the more pleasing. And is it important to be pleasing to the Lord? Is it important to want to be useful to Him? Certainly it is. That's why the Lord made you. That's why He sent His Son into the world for you, to make you this kind of person. You know, it's interesting today, it's been going on for years, but this whole idea of, of salvation apart from submission or that the Lord saves us simply to save us so that we can go about our way, do our own thing, and eventually arrive in heaven, that is so contrary to Scripture. God sent His Son into the world to save you in order that you might do what He has called you to do in order to turn you from your rebellion and make you into useful servants of His. He has a purpose for you. There's a reason why He has saved you. There is a path that He wants you to walk on. Now, if you would rather not walk on that path, if you'd rather please yourself, if you'd rather use your gifts for yourself to benefit yourself, you're stepping off of that path. And of course, we know from Pilgrim's Progress, what happens when you step off the path? It's never a good thing. And we're going to look at some of those things, actually this morning and this evening, that happen and why they happen. And perhaps understanding those things will strike a measure of fear in our hearts so that we will not want to do that, will not want to be selfish, but rather, you know, not self-centered, but rather God-centered, that we might do what He calls us to do. Now, certainly, that's what the Lord made you to do. And if you love Him, that's what you will want to do. And to our um, young people this morning who think that perhaps this sounds like a rather boring path to walk on, you know, it's not quite the adrenaline rush that you might get if you go after the things of the world with all the fun that it has to offer, you do need to realize that the greatest heroes who have ever lived and who have done the greatest things in history, who have been threatened the most and have been in the greatest danger, are those who have followed the Lord with all of their heart. You do need to remember that the Lord is willing to take you as far as you are willing to go for Him. He will use you, and it's not a boring thing. If you're a Christian, it's the only thing that will really satisfy you. This morning, then, let's consider this characteristic that we've been looking at so far this morning that the Lord is looking for in you, and that is the fact that He wants you to fear Him. As we read in Isaiah 66, 2, He wants you to be one who trembles at His Word. The fear of the Lord, as you know today, is something that is largely misunderstood, even at, well, especially in the churches. So we want to look at what it means this morning, and this evening we're going to want to look at how this fear should affect the way that you live. As a matter of fact, it will affect it because every Christian does fear the Lord. So first of all, what does it mean to fear the Lord? And this is important to understand because Solomon is telling us here in his introduction to the book of Proverbs that this is where true knowledge and wisdom begin. This is the starting point. If you don't understand this, you're not going to learn anything else. So what kind of, uh, what are we talking about here with regard to the, the fear of the Lord? Well, first of all, I think we need to understand what he's talking about with regard to knowledge and wisdom. He's not talking about the wisdom of the world. He's not talking about how to walk the road to material wealth, how to be rich and famous, although we do have to admit that when you do fear the Lord and serve Him, He sometimes does grant material wealth. I mean, the Lord is not opposed to doing that. Of course, He'll only give us what is right for us. He won't give us that which will destroy us. And Solomon here is not talking about a map on how to gain the honors of this world, although God does sometimes grant even honors in this world to those who will humbly serve Him. But Solomon is speaking primarily about that kind of wisdom that you need in order to please the Lord, in order to know the Lord, in order to be useful to the Lord. And if that's what you want then this is the only path you're going to find it on. You need to listen to this kind of wisdom. Now, secondly, notice to whom Solomon is speaking. I want you to notice that this book was not written just for children, but it was written to everybody who needs this wisdom, and of course, that refers to everybody. It does apply uh, 
primarily to the naive, I suppose you might say, maybe not primarily, but let's say first of all to the naive. Those who are still young, those who are still inexperienced with life, Solomon addresses numerous times through the book his sons, his children, because he was seeking to be a faithful father to them, to teach them how they could inherit God's blessing in the end, how it might be well with them, how they might live long on the earth. As a matter of fact, Paul uses those same words in Ephesians 6.3 when he talks to the children in the church, children, obey your parents, for this is the first commandment with a promise that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. In other words, the blessings that were promised of, of again, uh, what he means by this, things going well with them, living long on the earth, which are, are material and spiritual blessings, still apply in the new covenant. Solomon wanted these blessings for his children, so he was teaching them the fear of the Lord so they might gain these things. But we realize, secondly, that Solomon was not just a father to his children, and we realize those children may have been numerous, but there were actually many more he was responsible for. He was king, king of Israel. And as king, as the Scripture tells us, in a certain sense, kings are to be fathers to their children, which means they're also to instruct them in the right way in which they are to go so that they too might inherit these blessings. Sadly, we don't have that today. That's something we should be praying for today, that the Lord would give us such leaders. But we don't have those kinds of leaders. We do need to pray for them. But Solomon, being the king that he was, wrote this also for his subjects because they were, in a certain sense, his children. And again, realizing that what Solomon wrote here is the inspired Word of God. And God, as our Father, has recorded this for His children. This is for us as well. We are the children of God, and we are to listen to this wisdom. But of course, in case you think you've outgrown this book because you're no longer a youth, maybe you're older in years physically, or maybe you've been walking with the Lord for some time and you think, well, I really don't need a book that's written for children, uh, realize that this is a book you will never outgrow. Solomon goes on to write in verse 5, a wise man, one who is already wise, will hear and increase in learning. And a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. Uh, he wrote this book not just for the naive, not just for the youth, but also for those who are already wise that they might become wiser because no one can have enough of this wisdom. So this is the wisdom we're talking about, the wisdom that comes from God, the wisdom to please God, the wisdom that will lead to a long life and that it also may be well with us on the earth. That's a blessing I think we all might like to have, especially when we consider that the blessings go beyond just this world to that world which is coming. So what is the first lesson we need to learn on how to please the Lord? Well, he writes, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So that's why we need to understand the fear of the Lord. If we don't understand that, then we will, really will not be able to learn what it is Solomon is teaching us, the things we need to learn to please God. Now, you know the word fear can mean different things and in different contexts. And if you don't yet know the Lord, the kind of fear that will put your feet on the path of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge for you, would be that same kind of fear that Pilgrim had when he lived in the city of destruction. Those of you who have been reading the book or read the book know that he was afraid that the city was going to be burned with fire and that everybody in the city was going to perish with it. That was a description of the world. You need to understand that there is something to be afraid of, and that is God's wrath and His judgment. That is the beginning of wisdom for the unbeliever. Now, there is a reason why the Lord, when He was preparing Israel to receive the Lord Jesus Christ sent John the Baptist in front of him to preach for several months before he even appeared. It was to get them ready to bring them to repentance before he sent his son to preach the gospel. There's a reason why the Lord wants his ministers to preach the law of God and why he wants all his people as they witness of this gospel to share with others first what the Lord requires in His law and to speak about the judgment of God 
before the gospel is offered. There's a reason why the Lord Jesus Christ sends His Spirit into the world to convict it regarding sin and righteousness and judgment. And that reason is simply this, that people need to know why they need a Savior before they will ever reach out to the Savior. There needs to be a reason for people to turn. There has to be motivation before they will ever do it. Now, I know it's very much in vogue today to let that motivation be merely love. And we really need to ask ourselves the question, is love going to be the right motive for this? Love for God? Come, come to Christ because you love Jesus Christ, because you love God, because you love the things above. Those things are going to be attractive to you, and they're going to move you to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, can't you just tell them what Jesus Christ has done and of His great love, and won't that be enough? Well, you know, the problem is it would be enough if the person were already a Christian, if the person were already converted, if they already had the Spirit of God and already had a desire for those things, that would be enough. But the problem is unbelievers don't desire spiritual things. The Bible says that they are foolishness to them, so it's not going to give them the proper motivation. Well, what can motivate them? What will motivate them? Well, the fact that they're on their way to judgment that they're going to have to face God's wrath, that if they don't turn from their sins, that they will suffer for an eternity in hell, that will motivate them because they are afraid of those things. The Spirit actually uses the law to strike fear into the hearts of the unbelieving so that they will seek the Lord that they might live. You see, for them, this is the fear that leads to God's wisdom. It's a good fear. God doesn't terrorize for no reason, but He does that they might be saved. Now, does this kind of fear have any application to us, uh, to the church today? Actually, it does, not just because the Bible speaks about the fear of the Lord, but because we understand the Bible does tell us not everybody who names the name of Jesus Christ is actually a Christian. Jesus does say in the Sermon on the Mount that many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not perform miracles and do many wonderful works? And he will say, depart from me. I never knew you, you who work lawlessness. Not everybody in the church is necessarily saved. Now, it is true that everybody in the new covenant is saved. But not everybody in the visible church is necessarily a part of the new covenant. And that's why there are very real warnings in Scripture that are addressed to the churches, to the visible saints, that are meant to strike fear into their hearts so that they might turn to Christ while there's still time. Now, there's a very uh, sobering one in Hebrews, actually in the book of Hebrews there are several, but here's one of the more sobering ones. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 31, the author writes this, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the habit of some but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now listen, for if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You know, the thing is, 
the author to the Hebrews wrote this to those who were professing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wrote this, these particular things because this group was tempted by the persecution of Rome to abandon Christianity and to go back to a legal religion, which would, of course, allow them to escape that persecution. So the author to the Hebrews was trying to point out to them that though you may save your physical life by abandoning Christ to go back to Judaism, now you may lose your souls. Obviously, there were those in that congregation who really did not know the Lord, or at least the possibility was there, and he wanted to point out to them the terror of the Lord, the fear of the Lord to get them not to do that, not to sin against Him, but rather to hold on to Christ, to continue to walk in the straight and narrow path, and to do His will. I think the application to the church is, is very real. And we need to listen to every warning that the Lord gives to us and respond to it in a way that keeps us in the path of righteousness. I think its application to those who are outside the church is perfectly clear. But anyway, this is one of the uses of the fear of the Lord, but it does have other uses. There are other senses in which we are to understand these things. I mean, not only is this to keep us in the path of righteousness, not only the fear of judgment, but there are other senses in which we are to fear the Lord. And I think there's a couple of elements to that kind of fear even the true believer should have. First, there's what's called a filial fear. That fear that we would owe to God being His sons and His daughters. It's the same kind of fear, though, perhaps on a much smaller scale that, as the kind of fear that we felt towards our parents as they were raising us. At least we, we did if our parents uh, disciplined us. If, if there was no discipline, if there was only just you know, positive reinforcement, perhaps you wouldn't experience this. But you know what it's like to have parents who discipline you, and you know what it's like then to be afraid of doing what's wrong because of the discipline that you might receive. Now, I've already mentioned that many parents today, and hopefully not within the church, but, t but certainly those in outside the church, you might say, tend to only use positive reinforcement when they discipline their children. You do what's right, you get a reward. And of course, we should use this because it, it's very helpful and it's the right thing to do. The Lord does the same thing. But the Lord also tells us that we should use negative reinforcement. You do what's wrong and you get disciplined. Again, in the book of Proverbs, where Solomon is teaching wisdom to the people of God on how to raise their children, he says this, he who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. We're told today that spanking our children means that we hate our children. But the Lord tells us just the other way around. If you withhold your rod, you hate your children. But if you love them, you will discipline them diligently. The fear of discipline. Now, not punishment. This isn't retribution. You know, retribution has the crime in view, and I'm punishing you for this wrong thing you did. Discipline has in view uh, correction, instruction to get them to go on the right path. In other words, it has the motive that is love to get them to do the right thing. That's what discipline is all about, corrective discipline. It can be a powerful motivator, as you know, as you raise your children. Well, the Lord uses the same things with us. He uses positive reinforcement on us. He shows us a great deal of love. He's given us many promises of blessings for obedience to move us to obey Him. But He also uses negative reinforcements. He disciplines us so that we will fear Him, so that we'll have not one motivation but two motivations to serve Him because He loves us and cares about us. Again, the author to the Hebrews writes this in Hebrews 12 verses 9 and 10. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But He disciplines us for our good, so that we may share His holiness. 
Well, this is one element of the fear of the Lord that Solomon has in mind here, the fear of God's discipline. Because discipline is not a pleasant thing, as you know. God knows how to spank us to get us back on the path, and it's not a pleasant thing, but it is a good thing. Now, that's one element of the fear of the Lord, the fear of chastening, but there is another that we need to bear in mind, and it has to do with who God is. I mean, God is our Father, but remember, He is no mere earthly Father. The kind of fear that He should evoke in our hearts should be greater than the fear that our parents may have evoked in our hearts because of their presence and discipline. As God, you owe Him fear. In this context, we call this reverence. I know that many of you who, um, uh, well, in the Christian community have, are aware of, um, you know, the fact that dictionaries have been out for a long, long time. And our new, our modern dictionaries sometimes, uh, you know, they drop off old definitions that used to be useful, but there was one group, I forget exactly who, that brought back one of the old um, dictionaries, the old Webster Dictionary, and you can even find it in digital form online. And it has a very useful definition of the fear of the Lord. So listen to what it, what it says here. As applied to the Lord, it says this, the fear acceptable to God is a filial fear Okay, the fear of sons and daughters, so forth. An awful reverence of the divine nature, proceeding from a just esteem of His perfections, which produces in us an inclination to His service and an unwillingness to offend Him. Now, I would challenge you, open any modern dictionary and see if you're going to find a definition like that. It tells us that there's two elements to the fear of the Lord. There's not only that fear we owe Him as children, that He is our Father who will discipline us, but there is that fear we owe to Him by virtue of the fact that He is God. He is no man that says He's going to discipline us and spank us. He is the infinite, eternal, and unchangeable God. An awful reverence of the divine nature that rises from a proper understanding of who and what God is. Well, who is God? Well, contrary to the way he's presented in many churches, you know, God is my buddy. I walk with him, you know, and I go places with him and he does things with me. Or he is my genie in the bottle. I just pop open the bottle and I say, God, do this, and he has to do this because I have faith. Or he's like the one-armed bandit, you know, if I can just say those magic words that... that uh, that are in Scripture somehow, he's going to pay off or pray that particular prayer, the prayer, the prayer of Jabez. That was something that was popular a few years ago. God is not a servant or a genie to do my will, you see. He's quite a bit different. He's also not the antinomian God that many believe he is today, that God doesn't even care what I do as long as I trust in his Son. He's still going to take me to heaven even if it's against my will. No, the Bible says that He is the infinitely holy and righteous God who will do all His holy will. That He is one who cannot overlook sin, but the one who will punish every transgression of His holy will perfectly and fully. He is also the one who has infinite power and knowledge and presence, who not only knows what it is we've done, but has the power to deal with us for those things. And the fact that these things are true about God should, of course, especially the fact that He's holy, should evoke a kind of fear within us, a real fear, a terror, a fear that leads to obedience is what Solomon is teaching us. Or as Webster put it, it should incline us to His service and put within us an unwillingness to offend Him. So this appreciation of who God is and what He is, again, He's not just some genie, somebody who's pledged to be our servant. He is the holy, infinitely righteous and powerful God who loves holiness and hates sin. 
you, you, you've got to remember that even though we're in the Lord Jesus Christ, as our confession also reminds us, it's true what the Bible says, that our sins still deserve damnation. That's what they deserve. And we would be condemned if we weren't in Jesus Christ. But somehow that seems to be dismissed in our minds. It's not that important anymore. We need the fear of the Lord, the fear of who He is, and the fear of His fatherly discipline if we are going to have the proper motivation to walk in His ways. Now, as Solomon sets out to teach us what those ways are, is it any wonder that he begins here? If we don't have the proper motivation, we're not going to walk in His ways. Now, again, let's not dismiss the fact that God also loves His children. He's going to draw us forward with His infinite love, but He's also going to push us in the same direction with the fear of what He may do to us if we stubbornly refuse to walk in His ways. That is the fear of the Lord. So let's close with just one example of, of what, we, you know, what we read earlier actually in, in uh, Proverbs chapter 1. Remembering that it's written to the church, so it's addressed to you, and it's a warning of what could happen to you but for God's grace unless you fear the Lord and turn from your sins. Again, Lady Wisdom, because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention, and you neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof, I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes, when your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would not accept my counsel. They spurned all my reproof. So they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be satiated with their own devices. For the waywardness of the naive will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But he who listens to me shall live securely and will be at ease from the dread of evil. So what have we learned from this this morning? Fear the Lord. That's the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom. Turn from your sins. Walk in the paths of righteousness. You can only do that, of course, by trusting in the Son of God, who will give you the power to do this. One thing that we will see this evening is that the Son of God Himself, in seeking to be our example, of course, He was our perfect example, Himself walked in the fear of the Lord. If Jesus Christ feared the Lord, we should as well. doesn't mean He feared Himself. What it means is, of course, as a man, He was under those same obligations we were to serve this holy God, and He walked in the fear of the Lord, reverencing His Father, and His Father instructed Him. His Father disciplined Him, but not for sin. Discipline isn't always corrective. Discipline is instructive always. Uh, the Lord did that for Him. That's why He grew in wisdom stature and favor with God and man. And if that's true of Jesus Christ, it's certainly true of us because the Lord has ordained that we be conformed to His image and that we follow that example. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to be. And by the way, this is the kind of person the Lord is looking to use. This is what He wants to see in you, somebody who fears Him in this way and is willing to turn from your sins and to walk in His paths. Now, this evening, we're going to consider further how this fear is going to motivate us to go in the right direction, just how important it is to our Christian walk. But I hope at least this morning you have an understanding of what we mean by the fear of the Lord. It's not something we just dismiss, say, I don't have to be afraid. That's the Old Testament God. That's the way it was before I was a Christian. No, this is something we have to deal with as Christians because God is still God. He is still holy, infinitely holy and just. He is still everything that He was before. And He is our Father. And we do need to listen to Him because He loves us and He wants us to walk in His ways. And so He will discipline us. 
Well, for now, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask uh, the Lord to search our hearts because as we prepare to come to the table, we do need to consider whether or not we fear the Lord. You realize if God says you need to fear Him and you don't fear Him, that you're sinning because that's a command. You need to fear the Lord. I need to fear the Lord. We all do. So let's search our hearts to see whether or not we do fear Him and whether that fear is actually moving us to turn away from our sins and to walk in His ways because that is the fear that He is talking about here. Well, let's spend a few moments in prayer.